I typically begin my Fundamentals of Sociology classes with questions like, what annoys you? What bothers you? Or what makes you feel uncomfortable and why? My students and I grapple with these questions and share our answers in small groups, taking turns. The answers that we usually come up with are family problems, that is, if students are comfortable sharing them to begin with, relationship challenges, and school-related concerns. And this was before the pandemic. Today, amid the pandemic, we get the same answers still. But because of the introduction of online learning, we also focus on concerns that relate to lack of internet access or weak internet connection and online fatigue. Over the course of our conversations, we come to realize that what we consider to be personal actually mirrors something greater than us, something broader, something deeply entrenched, which leads the class to conclude that what they consider or what we consider to be private is actually public. And this is the reason why I wish to focus on the connection, the inevitable link between the private or the personal and the public or the societal. Realities that are usually viewed or seen separately or independently when they should be understood and viewed together simultaneously. As we continue this conversation, there are questions that need to be addressed. First, how do we define and distinguish the private from the public? And should there really be a separation? Is it really possible to envision a separation, a distinction? Second, what does it mean to think sociologically? And why is it important? Lastly, what are the implications of thinking sociologically to social action? In other words, how can we translate this frame of mind to public engagement? So let us first define what the private is. What constitutes the private? How do we usually understand it? No? Particularly when it comes to private troubles. So usually when I ask students to define what the private is, automatically they'd say individual challenges, personal concerns, and they would be correct. Merong isang estudyante, nag-aaral lang mabuti, mataas ang mga marka sa paaralan, pero sa kasawiang palad, kailangang magbitiw o ipagpaliban ang pag-aaral kasi nagkasakit ang nanay, hindi makapagtrabaho, wala ng tatay, so mas pinahalagahan ang paghahanap ng trabaho. Maaaring ito yung kanyang personal na pinagdadaanan. Meron din namang pagkakataon na isang batang babae sinasaktan ng kanyang tatay, ng kanyang kapatid o ng kanyang tiyuhin. Pero naguguluhan kung siya ba ay magsusumbong o hindi kasi kapamilya niya. So in a nutshell, these can be private troubles or personal problems that people confront directly. And what's interesting about it is these personal problems are the causes for why these people get blamed to begin with. Wala kang trabaho, samantalang yung kapitbahay natin na hindi nakapagtapos, may trabaho. Ikaw na nakapagtapos, hindi ka makahanap ng trabaho. Anong problema mo? Okay. Mababa na naman yung marka mo, hindi ka nag-aaral, tamad ka kasi, mahina yung kokote mo. So, if we tend to focus on individual challenges and problems, we tend to measure a person's worth by means of his or her talent. And we forget to look beyond that because there are other forces at work. And this is why it's also important to connect what's private with what's public. 
The public, in turn, when my students grapple over this reality, are larger social challenges, which transcend explicitly our local environments, you know, our comfort zones, our spaces, personal spaces, that is. And the examples that are usually thrown around are social inequality and alienation, political conflicts and violence, economic mismanagement and impoverishment. You know, realities that seem to be out there but are not directly affecting individual lives, no? but are nonetheless crucial. No? So, based on these definitions of what is private and what is public, there already seems to be a given narrative that these two realms or these two realities are separate. And hence, we can envision the distinction and the separation. But the sociologist C. Wright Mills begged to disagree. And I beg to disagree as well. In fact, it might be more important and it might be more apt to look at how the private and the public intersect. C. Wright Mills, in his book, The Sociological Imagination, actually interestingly asserts, and I quote, Neither the life of the individual nor the history of a society can be understood, can be comprehensively grasped without understanding both. So what does this mean? What does this say? That in order to understand individual lives, where we are and what we are as individuals, it is paramount that we grasp in a nuanced and critical way our cultural, historical, socioeconomic, and political contexts. In other words, we have to be cognizant of greater social forces that determine how we think, how we act in different circumstances. Okay? Put alternatively, the decisions that we make and cannot make are influenced by the nature of our politics, the type of economy that we have, and the values and norms that our society chooses to embrace and uphold. So this is a crucial discovery in terms of understanding why the public and the private are inexorably connected. So, Thinking sociologically, in other words, means to develop what C. Wright Niels calls the sociological imagination, which is simply put, seeing things socially. Now, the personal, as mentioned, becomes societal. The private becomes public, is shared. We see the general in the particular. Now, you may ask, what is so important and what is so special about the sociological imagination? How can we use it? No? There are two things I can think of where the sociological imagination can be best applied or practiced and why it benefits us in the long run. First, now that we have realized that such a frame of mind requires us to look beyond our comfort zones and our personal spaces and individual environments, if you may, we get a taste of what it's like to mingle with diverse groups of people. And the key term, the key takeaway that I wish us to remember here is the notion of diversity plurality of experiences, perspectives, backgrounds, notions, beliefs. And this is what's reality. This is what's everyday. This is what's commonplace. 
And so the sociological imagination teaches us to recognize and respect diversity. If I were to put it alternatively, I'd say it's seeing the strange in the familiar. A notion such as honor may be universal, may be commonplace, but the way we practice, the way we observe, and the way we express honor vary, depending on what culture you come from, depending on which society you belong to. Diversity, very important. Real, legitimate. Now, because we talk about diversity, it is more important to actually delve into a kind of diversity that seems so inevitable. People think it's natural, by the way. But for me, it's more systematically perpetuated. Inequality. And to be more specific, intersecting forms of inequality. What do I mean by this? To understand that we come from different backgrounds is to also realize that we occupy unequal positions in society. Whether it's economic class, whether it's social prestige, whether it's a political position, whether it's because of ideology, your religious affiliation, your gender or age, etc. So in other words, there are many indicators of disparity. There are many markers of inequality that we have to account for to be able to understand where we are and who we are. And the sociological imagination allows us to appreciate this. Why is it important to examine inequality? Because inequality is not or does not exist in a vacuum. Inequality is connected to other despicable forms. Right? To give you an example, to be a woman in a society, in an organization, in a context that has long celebrated and institutionalized patriarchy, is certainly difficult. Now imagine this. To be a poor woman belonging to a politically persecuted ethnic group in a geographically isolated and destitute area in the Philippines poses more debilitating problems and concerns. So this is what I mean by intersecting forms of inequality, which a realization of diversity also points us to, because inequality is a form of diversity that we have to address, that we have to examine, that we have to study. In the context of academics and students, we can think of applying the sociological imagination in schools in a university. And we can say that a university is actually a mini-society. It's a microcosm of society. Why? Well, on the one hand, diversity is all around. You have a plurality of courses. You have a plurality of interests. No? A university is made up of diverse groups of people with different backgrounds, with different political persuasions, you know, upholding varying ideologies and whatnot. And this is a good thing because a university needs to be more pluralist in this regard. A university needs to be diverse or needs to celebrate diversity. But it is also in the context of a university where both teacher and student learn what inequality is all about. Historically speaking, universities or schools are organized hierarchically. And so this is where we get a taste of what it means to be privileged, what it means to be bereft of certain resources, of certain capital. 
So the university is an excellent learning experience. The university is an apt platform where we can fully exercise our ability to see beyond the private and to connect it to the public. Now that we have comprehensively grasped what the sociological imagination, which is alternatively viewed as thinking sociologically is, the important question to answer would be, so what? Eh, ano ngayon? Ano ngayon kung ganyan ka nang mag-isip? Ano ngayon kung hindi mo sisisihin ang isang individual kasi ang problema ay panlipunan, sosyal, no? pampubliko? Right? To go back to the example a while ago, no? unemployment may be an individual problem. But if you look at current statistics, no, particularly 2020, in the context of the pandemic, 4.2 million people, 4.2 million Filipinos, actually lost their jobs. And if we situate a family's predicament within that broader landscape, what is personally troubling for that family is actually publicly debilitating because it's a public issue. Eh, ano ngayon? So what? If we think that way already, what benefit can we get out of it? In other words, how can we translate this to something tangible, to something practical? And this is where engaging sociologically is very important. What does it mean to engage sociologically? First, armed or equipped with this quality of mind, the ability to connect the private to the public, it would be much easier for us to appreciate realities that are cursorily examined, realities that are out there but are taken for granted because we value our expertise, we value what we've learned, we value what we have individually pursued and accomplished. As experts, it's difficult to actually open ourselves up and listen. But the sociological imagination is also about listening intently. And so engaging sociologically means opening yourself up and expressing willingness to actually listen to other realities that are also pervasive or present out there. Listening to other realities provides us more options. Listening to stories of other people with different backgrounds, with different experiences, with different biases, can help broaden or expand our perspectives. And if we are in the policymaking realm, it helps. It would put us in a better position to come up with more inclusive and nuanced policies not for a particular group of people, but benefiting more. Second, engaging sociologically also means that we realize that certain groups are privileged. And these privileges are not born out of talent or personal merit alone. These privileges are historic. These privileges are structurally perpetuated. And so our distinctions, the way society is organized hierarchically, is never really natural, no? but systematically orchestrated and protected. And the sociological imagination no, allows us to appreciate that, allows us to uncover that. No? So armed with that, we will be able to think of ways by which we can mitigate or we can neutralize such realities or such privileges or advantages to make societies more inclusive, to make organizations more participatory, to make our contexts and environments more livable despite our ideological, political 
and social differences. Finally, engaging sociologically means building or creating platforms where genuine collaboration with different groups of people can flourish and take root. After all, public issues cannot be solved by individual initiatives or by acting unilaterally. It might help momentarily, but in the long run, that can only do so much. So the sociological imagination teaches us that solutions to public problems, solutions to societal challenges, require inclusive, collaborative, and participatory arrangements. So it is my hope that through this conversation, we get to appreciate more what it means to think sociologically and to engage sociologically. But more importantly, I hope that through this exchange, we get to appreciate what it means for the public and the private to intersect. Thank you.